I say this a lot because it's all about statistics. If they have statistical significance in results, they sway that way. And it only makes sense. I mean, if if they have proof that over five, six years that statistically weightless students tend to perform worse in school, not get the best C score, not pass boards as often the first time, then it's statistically significant. And they know that these students tend to be the ones who struggle. And that's essentially the conversation I had was the waitlisted students tend to be the ones who, who do struggle more often than the ones who weren't. And not always, I'm just saying the overarching picture theme, you're, you're going to always have outliers. You're going to have people who are waitlisted who are like rock stars, right? And, and then you're going to have people who were not waitlisted who are struggling. So please understand that just because you're waitlisted does not mean that you're pigeonholed into this. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to create some awareness in you. So if you think you need something that you take action on it. Are waitlisted students more likely to not perform well in CRNA school? In today's episode, we're going to dig into the learnings I have gathered from my time talking to faculty. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to CRNA School Prep Academy. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, please make sure you do so so you don't miss any other episodes. So in today's uh, episode, we're going to talk about do waitlisted students tend to face more rejection from or dismissal from CRNA school or not passing boards the first time. So I wanted to bring this up not to scare you. I just want to enlighten and share my learnings over my time talking to faculty over this past week at the ADCE through the AANA. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to dozens of faculty and this got brought up um, with one of my conversations and I was I was very intrigued um, to kind of dive into this topic because I actually never would have thought um, this to be the case. Um, but I, I want to at least kind of clear clear the air and reassure you that, you know, everything's going to be okay. Um, so if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, no, no, I'm panicking. That's not my intention. But I equally want to bring some awareness around it because kind of if you listen to the last episode and if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. Kind of assessing what you think you need and not being afraid to seek out those resources is really step number one. Um, but let's kind of dive in. So if you have been waitlisted for CRNA school and you get off the waitlist, congratulations. I always tell students, you know, a waitlist is an acceptance because that means they want you. They just don't have enough seats. However, being a waitlist does mean that out of all their applicants, you were less than the others. I mean, not less. That's probably not the best phrase or best term, but you just didn't have something you maybe could work on more, right? Like, so if they had, you know, 20 people they could accept and, and they, they accepted 20 and they had 10 that were like pretty good and then they, they felt really good about them, there was still something that caused them to be on the waitlist, right? And so I encourage you to kind of think about that. And again, not to be in a negative way, guys, but just ultimately assess what and, and and talk to your faculty about this too. I encourage you to do that. I mean, if you're on a wait list and you get in, I think it's time to have a heart to heart with that faculty, whoever your faculty is, and say, I'm so honored and grateful to take this seat. You know, I do know I'm an alternate and I would love to discuss with you what it is you think I can do to better myself prior to starting school because clearly you saw something in me that was somewhat of a weakness and I want to work on improving that. I think their jaw would hit the floor. I think they'd be like, just amazed and excited, they would be so thrilled. So, and I think the reason why I think this is important is because they know that you have something that maybe needs teed up a little bit. That's ultimately why you got put on the wait list. And if you take that initiative to say, I would love to know what that is. I would love to work on that. How can, how do you think I can help myself? Beautiful. Like that's a beautiful way to lead. I want to help myself. How can I do that? Um, and, and honestly, before you ask that, I personally would try to reflect on what you think it may be. Um, maybe you felt a little rusty on your personal questions. So maybe it's emotional intelligence that you need a little bit of help with. Maybe you're a little weak and rusty on your clinical stuff. So maybe it's the clinical aspects that maybe you're a little rusty in. Maybe you have a C in, in chemistry and maybe that was the differentiating factor where your GPA was a little bit lower. So maybe your chemistry is a little rusty. And I'm not saying you'll take a chemistry course um, for the most part, but it, it it may also not hurt, right? Um, you know, the NAR boot camp that we have, the Nurse Institute Resident Boot Camp, we teach basics of chemistry, which might be a nice, like, concise overview of what concepts you need to know. An entire chemistry course may be a little overkill. But again, if you do the NAR boot camp, you'll get chemistry focused on what they need you to know in anesthesia school, which would then allow you a focused study plan. And, you know, you could take those things we teach in that hour session or the hour um, lecture of chemistry and then dive deeper on your own through things like Khan Academy and things like that. So 
again, the NAR boot camp, the Nurse Institute Resident Boot Camp was, was made to give you guided study. So when you, before you start your programs or shortly after starting your programs, you have kind of a tailored outline, um, really specific roadmap for you to follow. So you know exactly what it is that you can help, how you can help yourself essentially. But ask, ask for feedback, try to identify where you think your weaknesses are and talk to the faculty about that and see what they would recommend. So before you start your program, you feel a little more confident and excited to start. I, I think a lot of waitlisted students kind of hold this unfair anxiety because they were waitlisted. And so when they get in, they're like, am I really good enough? Like they kind of have an imposter syndrome. Like, was I really chosen? You know, can I really do this? I don't know. They didn't weren't sure about me. So I'm not sure about myself. And that that's not a good place to be. So you really need to f focus on what it is you can do to help yourself and really combat that imposter syndrome and that confidence issue by trying to find ways and asking for their guidance on how you can improve. Um, but ultimately, when I had this discussion with faculty about waitlisted students, based on the statistics, and again, I say this a lot because it's all about statistics. If they have statistical significance in results, they sway that way. And it only makes sense. I mean, if if they have proof that over five, six years that statistically waitlisted students tend to perform worse in school, not get the best C score, not pass boards as often the first time, then it's statistically significant. And they know that these students tend to be the ones who struggle. And that's essentially the conversation I had was the waitlisted students tend to be the ones who, who do struggle more often than the ones who weren't. And not always, I'm just saying the overarching picture theme, you're, you're going to always have outliers. You're going to have people who are waitlisted who are like rock stars, right? And, and then you're going to people who were not waitlisted who are struggling. So please understand that just because you're waitlisted does not mean that you're pigeonholed into this. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to create some awareness in you. So if you think you need something that you take action on it. I, I keep hearing this. Everyone says, oh, don't do anything. Take the next six to nine months to do absolutely nothing. And that may work for some people but it may not work for everyone. But remember, whenever you get advice from anyone, you guys, you have to ask yourself, does this apply across the board 100%? The answer is usually no. The answer for any advice is usually it depends, <laughs> which is not always ideal and kind of frustrating, right? But that's when you have to then decipher, well, if this advi advice doesn't apply 100% of the time, does it apply to me and why or why not? And so if you kind of investigate a little bit around that advice, it'll allow you to make a decision for yourself. Don't let someone else tell you what you need. Only you know what you need, okay? That's the, that's the reality of it. And I don't care if they disagree with you all day long. If you know that you need something, you you get what you need. You you stand up for yourself and say, "No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm going to investigate my emotional intelligence now because I don't want to get into school and struggle, right? And be threatening to be kicked out of clinical." And you know, whatever it is, I mean, I don't know, but I'm just trying to help you. And, and, and emotional intelligence is not just being about kicked out of clinical. It could be about like helping yourself and keeping mental wellness. You know, one of, that's probably more common, I would say. Most people are not argumentative, but most people really suffer with emotional intelligence because it kind of becomes kind of a, a downer for you and your own self-esteem if you don't have a good mindset, if you don't have the growth mindset, right? Um, I'm reading a book right now. It's called 15 Commitments to Conscious Leadership. It is really good. It's really insightful, mostly on how you think and how you deal with problems like placing blame, for example, whether you are the victim, the villain or the hero. And and they're all bad. Just a hero is not good <laughs> in the situation. And so kind of identifying how you take negative feedback that you see negative anyways. And remember, every time you have a thought, you place the value on that thought. It's you who makes the decision whether it's positive or negative. So even if something maybe is not ideal, you then can say, well, that's okay. I mean, that just means there's room for improvement. That's a positive thing versus, oh, I'm not a good person. I stink at this. My skills stink. I, I must, I, I don't even deserve to be here. That's a very negative way to take a bad result. So again, but you have control of that. Like that's the beauty in all of this, you guys, is understanding the fact that you actually are in control. It may not always feel that way. And I understand, 100% um, understand, but it's reflected on the fact that when you get in those negative spaces that you have to reassure yourself, I'm in control. I have the control to assign a positive or negative implication to this result. How can I assign a positive one, right? And it, and it may take some time and it, it might not always feel natural. It definitely won't feel natural. I feel like, what am I doing? I'm telling you this terrible thing is a good thing. Like this isn't, this is not right. But it, it's just like over time, it, it doesn't become like, okay, it's not always 
rainbows, but it could be, you know, some sunshine. It doesn't have to always have rainbows with the sunshine, but it could at least see brighter things coming from dealing with the storm, right? So knowing it's going to end. And um, ultimately, yeah, I think just kind of reflecting on that and knowing how to support yourself is huge for someone who has been waitlisted. Hey, future CRNA, another daily dose of inspiration along your CRNA journey. In today's success story, we're going to share kind of an untraditional experience from one of our students. So the post reads, I'm so excited to post. I was accepted into CRNA school. I interviewed at my dream school. The meeting and panel showed me that this was really not the place for me. Although it was close to my home, the culture and I weren't a match. So after a bit of a traumatic interview experience, I was invited to interview at another school. Side note that I applied to three schools, waitlisted at one. The negative feeling was mutual at my top choice. They accepted at the program that became one of her dreams. Anyway, I called and spoke with the director before the interview, and within minutes, I was excited beyond words. There was a warmth and character that resonated with me. I moved forward with the interview. A couple hours after the interview, they offered me a position in the cohort for the spring. Mind you, the application was for spring 2024, not 2023. So what an incredible surprise that I get to start my journey a year earlier. I don't think this would have been possible without Steering School Prep Academy and my mock interview. Larissa was fantastic for the mock interview and helped me get over unsettling experience from my former dream school. The podcast lectures, resources, mock interview, all CSBA had to offer made this possible. Thank you so much. Don't give up. Don't be afraid to be untraditional in your career path. Study and believe in yourself. Things turn out the way they are meant to be. I just love this so much because while this student had an unfortunate experience at what they thought was their dream school, they turned it around. And they also were waitlisted at a school that didn't start till 2024. And when they got asked to interview at the third school, they were so shaken up by their previous experience, they decided to call and talk directly to this program prior to even interviewing. Now, mind you, they had already knew they had a seat at a school, but didn't start till 2024. But after talking with this other program faculty, they knew they had to give themselves a chance to interview. They felt instantly connected to this program um, faculty, and they were so happy they did because they got in just a few hours after the interview, and they get to start CRNA school an entire year sooner. So I wanted to share this with you because I thought this was really inspirational. And it just goes to show that kind of what we have preached before on the show is that this is a two-way street. You are picking your programs and you may have your dream program in mind, but the reality is it may not be the right fit. And you may have to kind of improvise and pivot to a different school. And it may actually turn out to be the best decision for you ultimately is to not get into what you think is your dream school. So go into it with an open mind. I'm rooting for you. Thank you so much for sharing this story. Congratulations. You know who you are and I'm always cheering you on. Um, but ultimately what I can tell you too is to when you're in school and and whether you're waitlisted or not, this does not matter. This covers, this is for every single person who enters CRNA school. If you feel like something's not clicking or you're not, maybe the pace is too fast and you feel like you're falling behind, you're not getting your assignments done, you're not doing your reading and whatever it may be, you have to address why you think that is and then bring it to their attention so you can get help before you have a bad outcome, which means a bad grade, a bad test, flunking in a class, whatever. Um, because once the outcome happens, once it's kind of set in stone, they can't really do anything to help you. It's kind of like, well, we have a policy and the policy is that you have to be dismissed from our program and we have to follow the policy because we treat everyone the same. And, you know, so often people are like, oh, can you make an exception? No, it, it, like a rule is a rule. And again, the sounds really harsh, but it's just the reality. So the only way you can prevent that from happening is to be proactive versus reactive. I'll say it again being proactive versus reactive, and ultimately being resourceful. Don't just expect someone to know what you need or know how to help you. You have to ask. You have to understand. And that's, again, the last episode. It takes work to understand what you need. And it's frustrating when you don't know what you don't know. What I have found, what helps me the most, because there's so many things I don't know that I wish I knew. (laughs) But really what helps me is just investing in my own growth and learning by trying different resources, by by buying books, by doing group peer projects, by listening to people, by 
just being a fly on the wall sometimes and listening to other people, it's a huge place for growth and being open to the fact that you might not be right. And it's okay even if they're not right. You learn from their wrongness. You learn from your wrongness. You learn from your rightness. And equally, collaboratively together, that's a beautiful thing because it creates more perspective. It creates more adaptability. It creates more flexibility and it creates more resourcefulness. And it creates a way for you to know how to help yourself. I'll tell you right now, there there is no excuse to not do to be able to do something you want to do because there are always resources out there for you. It may be really hard to find. You may have to sniff out the right person, but it's it's there. I promise you, this world has it for you. You just have to be willing to look, and it might have to be under stone after stone after stone before you find it. And and, and it's just like that persistence, right, and determination to really improve and, and improve on self awareness and things of that nature. So I guess I'm reassuring you the fact that you're going to be okay. Um, so whether you're a waitlisted student or not a waitlisted student, I think if you take this approach, you're going to be okay. I think where students run into problems is if they try to do things alone or they think if I ask for help, that's seen as a weakness or, and, and that really, that's a fixed mindset, first of all. That's being aware that if I have to ask for help, I'm not good enough. That's a fixed mindset. And so you need to sh- shift that mindset and say, what is it about asking for help that makes me not worthy of getting, like, not worthy of growth? Like, why why is asking for help seen as a negative thing? And really get to the bottom of that. You'd be surprised that some of these things are really rooted in your childhood. And I'm not saying that it was anyone's, it's not, and the thing is, it's not anyone's fault. As a child, your brain is not even fully developed and the way you interpret things can be completely off, Right. But that's just the way it is. And so your little brain learns these things and takes things probably not the most, uh, the best way. And it sticks with you until your adulthood, unless, unless you assess it, unless you're aware, unless you're like, oh, that's probably not the best mindset to have around that. Like, do I really need to feel that way about that? No. Like, why? And then getting out of that why, and I'm telling you, if you really dig, and I mean, when you think you have your why, ask why again. And then when you think you have that why, ask why again. You got to keep asking why, why, why. And before you know it, you're like, holy cow, I can't believe I just dug back to like my seventh grade teacher who laid into me about something or whatever it is. I don't know. It could be something from your childhood that you had no idea had a massive impact on how you handle stress or situations or negative feedback. And it can really, really shape and, and change your life. And until you become aware of that, it's it's just a natural instinct, right? It's like you get defensive right away because you, you've had this experience that has kind of left an impression on you. So it doesn't always have to be that way. So again, um, you know, I, I want to stress this so much for really anyone going through CRNA school, but especially if you're someone who feels that maybe you're not going into this with the, like the strongest background and you do think you might have a weakness, find resources. Again, they're out there. If you're, if it's writing, there's a free writing course through Coursera called Writing in the Sciences. It's free. I mean, do those types of things. Read books. There's tons of great books. Um, Make It Sticks a good one. Uh, I think it's by Peter Brown. Daniel Goldman is another great book called Emotional Intelligence. But books, you guys, books, 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 and more books. And I listen to a lot of books on audio. And again, I told you about the um, 15 commitments to a conscious leader. Great. It's great. It's amazing. It's like, oh, like just, wow, it's really insightful and it brings upon, upon a lot of awareness of to, I didn't realize I was doing a toxic trait, right? The being a hero and, and trying to take blame for other people, like that's equally as toxic as being a victim or a villain. So it's, it's a great book, um, but there's so many great books out there. It's also what I'm saying. There are always ways to help yourself. You just have to seek out opportunities like that. And your faculty are a great place to start. They know what students need and they know what can help you. And so having that open conversation Doing some self-reflection first, having the open conversation is a really great place to start when you start your CRNA journey. And I promise you, if you do that, you will be okay. And let's say it again, you will be okay. You can do this. You got this. You're worthy. You're capable. Shape that mindset. If you start doubting yourself, start feeling fear, say, no, I'm here for a reason. I can assess my weaknesses and I can work on them. Let's do this. I can do this just as well as anyone else. And you will. So cheers to your future CRNA. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. Be sure to um, check out Serenade School Prep Academy if you're not already a student. I hope to see you in there and I'll see you guys next week. All right, bye-bye. Hey 
future CRNA. As always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you. So screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at Sierra School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to SierraNaySchoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your Sierra journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week. Thank you.